Well, I have the idea of this uh, approach of research, in fact, because when I began my to work in the this business school, the Champagne School of Management, I noticed that, well, I, I believe that because I would work with people that would well, teach about business, that we would have the same mentality and the same approach to research. And in fact, I discovered that it wasn't the case, that in fact, well, sociology was well, well impregnated in business administration teachings. And <clears throat> And in fact, they were even uh, resurrecting a lot of, let's say, socialistic uh, theory. And so I had the idea, well, what was the problem? Why didn't they, well, you, as Professor Klein said today earlier, uh, well, you have entrepreneurship theory, and a lot of people are talking about entrepreneurship now, but... Uh, when you see they aren't really using, for example, the Austrian theory. And I wanted to understand why. And I had to do a mea culpa anyway, because it, is, it was true that there are many points that we aren't treating, in fact, which are related to entrepreneurship theory. Uh, but this doesn't, and so even if uh, the arguments of these uh, other theorists in, let's say, sociologists and so on, who are infiltrating business administration, education, even if they aren't uh, maybe correct in our perspective, there are certain conceptual tools that we can use, in fact. Well, we could develop them by ourselves, I believe so, but why lose time doing that? And it is much better to do counter Gramscianism and use their own concepts for us and that to say that we can also explain that. So my point of departure is a praxeological model, so typical based on Rothbard and Mises. Well, the well, we have the entrepreneurial agent who has means, okay, and well, he, is, he lives where we're affected by social conditions of action and natural conditions of action. Well, natural conditions of action, well, they are uh, tackled by science. But the problem is the social conditions of action. The fact is that we, in fact, perceive, well, we receive this information. And based on this information, as Menger would say, the knowledge or the belief of the knowledge that we have of how things work, well, we will use our means and interact with these social conditions. Social conditions that of course, they are people, other individuals. So we invest based on this information, okay? So we interact. The interaction is this investment, the engagement of means. And the problem is this, that the part, well, of course, this, is, this takes time, no? And the fact that it takes time, it means that what? That when I act, there is always an unperceived information or misperceived or completely new information that I didn't have access to before. And this is what will imply either success and gain or failure and loss. But it doesn't end there because, well, we have then the concept that the sociologists use a lot of reflexivity. No, whatever we do will then reflect on the social conditions and nature, well, nature maybe, well, Earth is avenging itself against us. Well, well <clears throat> our failure or success will then re be reflected, will be assimilated by other agents, okay? And we will have to renew the cycle, in fact. We, will always, ha we always have this continuous feedback process going on. So, Based on this, I arrived to the conclusion that we have three dimensions defining entrepreneurial action, which are profit-seeking. We look for some gain, okay, maybe, let's say, social, uh, political, uh, pecuniary, and so on, but they are always economic uh, gains. We have uncertainty bearing the charge of losses, and the ultimate power of decision-making. Are we concentrating the first two? The ultimate power of decision-making is the one that, well, given by uh, Knight, the power to stop everything. We have the power, since I am the owner of this investment, well, my real power isn't just to combine things. No, the real power is to say, no, stop. I won't go on. <clears throat> Only the entrepreneur has this power, not even the manager has it. 
And, <clears throat> well, I begin them all with profits seeking them. And with this uh, analysis, I will be concluding that, in fact, we must, in order to identify the entrepreneur, in order to use it to explain other, let's say, uh, <clears throat> more social <clears throat> consequences of action, and in order to identify the entrepreneur to know what, how policy making actually impact enterprise building, well, we have to understand first how it works, how these dimensions work. So I believe that first of all, we have this, the non-entrepreneur and entrepreneur. The non-entrepreneur, well, he gives in, initial or intermediate goods or higher order goods, if you want. And the entrepreneur, well, pays him with capital funds. This will imply what? A symmetric and a synchronic price determination. It is synchronic because, well, they are determining the price within, in, within the exchange. And it is symmetric because they agree on the price. Okay. Well, the thing is that, well, the entrepreneur will have its, his demand. It will be the same thing. The entrepreneur will sell intermediate or final goods or lower order goods. And the demand will pay with, well, it's money, well, which will be the revenue of the entrepreneur. The same thing again, synchronic and symmetric price determination. But the entrepreneur actually derives his net revenue, okay, from a diachronic asymmetry of utility, which will be the basis of a diachronic asymmetry of prices. So the entrepreneur is characterized by this diachronic profit-seeking or gain-seeking, not like uh, a non-entrepreneur integrated, we're not say employed, and say integrated in the entrepreneur's enterprise. So what this means, in fact, that the profit opportunity then is, it isn't, well, obviously, the problem is what? Well, we have social conditions of action that are always mutating, and we are reacting to them, and we have to take into consideration demand, but it isn't just that. In fact, I believe that the profit-seeking question is socially situated, in which sense that Okay, entrepreneur is the guy doing this diachronic profit seeking, but everybody does that at uh, any moment in time. We are all entrepreneurs. Well, this is the conclusion of Mrs. in the human action. But then, okay, it won't serve us to know well, how a policy making may impact this kind of enterprise or the other one, or about uh, enterprise building. So the problem is who, under a given context, a given enterprises and an enterprise is the diachronic profit seeking. And so the question then is to talk about opportunities. And the problem is, well, if we are going to see that, well, okay, everything is changing all the time and I uh, act by the uh, accordance to the knowledge I believe I have of reality, well, the thing is that opportunities will not be created they will not be uh, discovered, but they will be formed by interactions of what? Of demand preferences, of competitive supply, of the unintended consequences of contiguous actions. That is, actions that are, they aren't really aiming at our opportunity, but they can in a, any way uh, affect it. <clears throat> they are unintended because, well, for example, uh, I am a researcher, uh, let's say, I am an oil producer, and there was this residue as I was not using. Then there is this other guy who was working in the textile industry, you know, and, well, he discovered that this residue could be used as lycra, you know, and, well, you see, and he began to imagine, well, this could be another, a new opportunity. So this unintended, unintended consequence of the residual production of oil refin, uh, refination, uh, refination, well, will impact the apparition of uh, opportunities. Then you also have intended consequences of contiguous actions, government action, for example, or even, I don't know, grassroots actions, grassroots organizations, then changing things or uh, opinion for, uh, formators changing things, <clears throat> the way people think. 
and of course, entrepreneurial action. So the next problem then, well, okay, so opportunities, they are formed, they are a social event, in fact. Uh, and <clears throat> why will they be this social event? What's the, the relationship with the entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneur? The fact will be first, uh, why we don't discover them or create them, because that would imply certain profits. Well, the problem is uncertainty, of course. And what is this socially situated uncertainty that will eventually characterize the entrepreneur? First, this is the problem of imperfect rationality. That is, we, aren't, we don't just have limited access to information. We are prone to error interpreting it. So we have the social nature and natural conditions of action where we find the real profit opportunity, which is forming, okay, it doesn't exist per se, and we have the mind. We have our lagged perception, our subjective knowledge, so here we have the Bergsonian uh, concept of time perception, and imagination. So we perceive the information imperfectly, and we estimate then the profit opportunity which will be the basis of our decision-making. Another problem here is reflexivity. Yes, the same concept used by sociologists. Well, we have time, and entrepreneurial action, well, is what? Imperfect mind plus dispersed knowledge. And the other human agency occurring in our social environment is also about imperfect mind and dispersed knowledge. And when we act, we are generating information which feedbacks in other people's actions, and the same thing is happening with us. And this results in what? Creation and obsolescence of information. A continuous and eternal process of creation and obsolescence of information. And that is uncertainty. So the entrepreneurial success and failure will depend then on what? On a presence and sufficiency of convergence between what? The four factors which will form the real opportunity if it will exist or not. So this is why I'm talking about presence and the estimation of the, uh, made by the entrepreneur. He will invest based on his estimations. And if the convergence is sufficient, I'm not saying great, big or small, sufficient only, maybe he will have success. Otherwise, it will be a failure. Now, this also implies that we have two kinds of uncertainty affecting actions. This is how we were going to talk about the nexus. Uh, we have general uncertainty environment, and we have this. I believe that every enterprise has an specific uncertainty of convergence. What this means? This, the general environmental uncertainty is caused by what? The intended consequences of all actions in the general social structure. When I say social structure, I'm not, I'm not meaning a body, a smooth colored society. I'm talking about a network of individual actions. Just that. And also organized according to institutions, customs, conventions, organizations, and so on. But it is a structure that we see we consider it as entities, and we act in regard to them. Well, we also had an intended one, and they affect all enterprises and opportunities. But moreover, we also have this specific uncertainty affecting convergence. Caused by what? Well, exactly the four factors I talked about, but they are all specific to the social segment on which we are uh, creating or uh, creating our enterprise or our entrepreneurial projects. And it affects only the specific enterprise and associated opportunity to it. So what are the uncertainty charges? Well, the entrepreneurial ones are charge of the enterprise's specific losses and the integration of other agents into the entrepreneurial structure. So what this means is that, in fact, who is the entrepreneur? Who is the diachronic profit seeker? in a given context, social context, or enterprise. It is simple. It is the guy who is integrating other people's actions, how? Contractual revenues, and having and facing the charge of, the specific charge of uncertainty of that enterprise. The other guys, since they are just integrated by, con by contracts, okay, so they aren't really facing that uncertainty. This doesn't mean that they aren't entrepreneurs 
in general. Yes, they still are, but in, re uh, in regard of this specific enterprise, they aren't. So they are still affected by general uncertainty, and they also have, uh, face specific uncertainty relative to their own enterprises. For example, as a wage earner, I have to face the uncertainty of, uh, as a consumer. So what is the entrepreneurial nexus? So we have this um, environmental uncertainty, which is caused by society in general, okay, by all individuals in the social network, Okay, and we have, for example, this enterprise, okay, which has its specific uncertainty. We have the capital, well, which is invested and affected so by uncertainty in order to uh, capture the opportunity. We have these other entrepreneurs, too. They are doing the same thing. And the thing is this, I integrate them in my capital. I pay them and I integrate now their services in my, my capital structure. The same thing, and how? By contractual revenue. The same thing with this guy here, okay? And so now, they aren't really facing my uncertainty. They are facing theirs. But they are still affected by general uncertainty anyway. And here you have this other guy. And again, I integrate my enterprise in his uh, enterprise by selling a product, perhaps. I don't know, our services. And he pays me... Uh, by contract. This contract may mean isn't necessarily long term. It can be immediate term. For example, a provider paying, giving me its, his services or goods. And, well, we can have opportunity dependence. This is just to show that, in fact, uh, the other enterprise as being, a, let's say, a demander uh, will, in fact, mold the opportunity of an enterprise. And so we can see that uh, entrepreneurship acts as a nexus of enterprises. Just to finish, oh, time's up. <laughs> Just to finish, then, uh, what for? Simple. If we can identify the entrepreneur, if we can know who is the diachronic profit seeker, uncertainty bearer, and ultimate decision maker in an enterprise, we can then answer, well, will policy making, will this policy affect it or not? And the fact is, if we use this praxeological theory, which is compatible, I believe, with Giddens, Bourdieu, uh, Coleman's theory, well, we can know that, in fact, maybe this policy, well, surely this policy making, well, inter in, uh, active intervention policy making will not, uh, will affect it negatively. Thank you very much.